Janet and I were making a film with Henry Williamson called The, the Vanishing Hedgerows, and it was while we were making this film that um, Henry obviously trusted us and uh, thought that we were the right people to, to make um, a film of Tarka the Otter. Um, many people had tried to get the rights from him before, uh, including Disney, but um, he felt he hadn't found the right team. And with us, he obviously felt he had found the right team. And so in about 1970-71, we uh, were given the uh, task of writing a script and uh, turning it into a, into a film. The problems of uh, making a film with animals, basically, are that uh, you can't give them a script the night before to read and uh, learn up. You can't give them marks to, to come to uh, so that they, they come within focus of the camera. And uh, basically what you can do with animals is you can uh, make them go from A to B in the same way that you might make a dog uh, come to you when you call. You can put them in a box which has got a remote control device on it, let them out and then call, and they will come straight to, towards you. If you want anything else, some kind of reaction, you can put a scent of some kind on a rock or uh, place in between and they'll stop and react to that and then you can do the close-ups and carry on with the actual making of the sequence for that particular part of the film. But they're certainly not uh, peaceable when you're trying to get them to act. They're um, very sure of what they want to do and you find yourself accommodating the unit to the animal. I mean, I think this is possibly the case with most stars of films, but uh, even more so with otters, because uh, you could tell there was a glint in Spade's eye. That's the otter that plays Tarka some mornings when we would arrive on location, that today he didn't really want to act at all. And there was a definite feeling, I think, with him that uh, he, would, he would do the work when he felt like it and not when we did. And they can be not aggressive, that's the wrong word, but they can be firm as to, as to the extent, how far they will go, and you have to be conscious of that. I suppose the ratio that we shot at, that is extraordinary. I mean, the editor went through 47 miles of film because you think, for instance, that a shot of an otter swimming left to right across a river is going to be easy, and so you allow yourself an hour to do it, you turn up, you, you release the otter from his box, and eight hours later, he's, not, he's gone right to left all the time. He will not go left to right. But then again, you find with a difficult shot that you allow two days to achieve. For instance, there's a shot in the film where he comes up out of the leet and climbs onto a water wheel, and we thought, well, he'll never do this. I mean, this is going to be the most difficult thing to get him to sort of walk 15 yards, climb up over a parapet, get onto a water wheel. He did it first time. So you're, you're thrown all the time. You never know which way he's going to go. Most of the films that uh, we've made have, in fact, been about animal-human uh, relationships. Uh, the first one we made is called The Goshawk, and it was based on a, a marvellous book by T.H. White, and it was about a falconer trying to train a hawk. The duel, if you like, between the man and the bird, the clash, the clash of uh, wits, the, the man trying to wear the hawk down. He had to sit up with it three days and three nights. And whether the bird was going to give way first or wh whether the man was going to give way. Um, there was another one we made soon after that called To Build a Fire, which again was about a man and a dog. It was set during the gold rush. Uh, the man was a newcomer to uh, the, the Klondike, which is where the gold rush was. Uh, he goes on a simple journey from, from A to B to meet his friends. In very, very cold weather, he's been advised against it by an old-timer. Um, the dog knows that the man shouldn't go out in this kind of weather, but, but the, the man doesn't. The man freezes to death, the dog survives. Dan Badger and All the Coal was another of the, the kind of human-animal relationship stories about a pit boy who works um, on the most modern coal-cutting machine down a mine in Wales, and how he's transferred to work with another kind of machinery. And when he finds it's a pit pony, he's very disgusted. Uh, but gradually, a relationship um, develops between them, 
And when the part of the mine that the pit pen is working is, is phased out, and the, the story is that the pit pen is going to be destroyed, done away with, he of course is up in arms about this and uh, decides that he must have this pit pony and he learns to ride, it all ends happily, he gets the pit pony and uh, they go off into the setting sun and uh, we've got a nice happy ending for a change. <laughs> the Shadow of a Falcon um, was a, a film based on another book um, about the peregrine falcon uh, which is probably the most spectacular bird of prey there is very prized by falconers as being the best killer, super flying powers, uh, marvellous to look at. And it was really showing what has happened or what man has done to the peregrine falcon over the ages. First falconry, um, peregrine falcons passing hands for a thousand pounds a bird. Uh, then with the introduction of guns, uh, falconry went into decline, but at the same time, because people used to shoot pheasants and partridges and grouse, uh, the peregrine then became a pest, so it was shot. Um, also, people started collecting eggs. There was a great interest in natural history, so peregrine's eggs were taken. Then later, uh, during the war, the peregrine became a sort of ally of the Germans. It used to intercept the, the carri carrier pigeons that were released from Sunderland flying boats, things like that. And um, so it was decreed by the government that peregrines should be shot. If Tarka the Otter fails to entertain, then it's a failure as a film. I think Henry, when, when he wrote it, it meant more to him than an entertainment. Uh, David and I have o felt that it has, I mean, this sounds rather uh, pseudo, but it does have the quality of a sort of Greek tragedy in that Tarka is the hero, the barn owl, Eldritch, and the heron, Old Nog, are the sort of Greek chorus who just watch this animal and his inevitable doom and do nothing to help him at all. That, well, they can't. But it has that sort of element of tragedy. I think the one thing that we would have liked, I mean, otter hunting has been banned, so that's a good thing. If it hadn't, then I think this film possibly would have speeded the banning up. And also, I mean, it's very sad that Henry Williamson, who wrote the book, is no longer with us. And all the way through the making of the film, it had rather the quality for David and I of a sort of home movie that we were making it for Henry because he'd been so reluctant for so long to release the rights of the film that when he finally did, then he was obviously very much in our minds that he was the natural recipient of whatever it was we produced. We were, we were filming this a very emotional scene where the, the hound uh, is killed by Tarka and comes bobbing up to the surface and the, the girl sees it and everyone is disgusted by it. And so it was a very emotional time. And um, we went on filming right till the end of the day and everyone's thoughts were about uh, the, the death of Deadlock and Tarka and uh, you know, this is the end scene of the film. And uh, we finished late evening, long shadows. And then the next day, uh, which is a Saturday, we were doing some insert shots on the hound. And Richard Williamson, Henry Williamson's son, came up to us. And uh, he did the most extraordinary thing. He put out his hand to shake my hand. I thought this is a bit odd. So I shook him by the hand. He said, David, I thought you'd like to know that while you were filming that death scene last night, Henry died. And I thought, uh, my goodness, that is more than a coincidence. And it really made the, you know, the hackles on one's back, the back of one's neck uh, rise, something like that. It was almost as though it was predestined and very sad indeed. It's a kind of unique, privileged view for people to know what an otter's world is like. It, people want to believe that animals live a life that we live, which is the concern for, for others. And animals basically don't have that concern. They, they kill to, to survive. It's an entertainment, though, basically.
There was one particular day um, when we were filming the death scene, that is the, 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 the duel between Deadlock and Tarka at the end of the story. Um, this is in August last year. And uh, we were filming principally on the, the girl who sees the dragonfly light on the, uh, on the otter's nose when it has escaped, and on the hound, uh, Deadlock, who is dragged out of the water after he's been killed by Tarka. And while we were setting up this, and it only concerned the girl and, 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 the, and the huntsman, um, one of the hunt servants came up to us and said, would it be possible for the hounds uh, who were not being used in the scene to be, to be exercised. And uh, I said, as long as they're kept well out of it, of, of course it is, because it's a very hot day. So they were let out of their van and uh, run down the field, close to where we were filming, uh, away from us. And we had a very big unit uh, of about 35 strong and actors. So we had location caterers. And underneath the location catering van, there was some mink who had been scavenging on the um, you know, bits and pieces left over from the meals. And the hounds found these mink, uh, which are like very small otters, a kind of weasel. And the hounds chased them. And as the hounds went away in full cry after these mink, one of the locals who was taking part in the film as a hunt follower said, uh, watch out that way, because there's a railway. And although there's one train a day, you know, it could come through. And as luck would have it, or as bad luck would have it, as the hounds went up the embankment after these mink, the one train a day came through. And the huntsman said, as he got to the top of the bank, that he couldn't believe that all the hounds hadn't been killed because hounds went in every direction all over the place. And in fact, two hounds were killed. So that was very sad, and uh, we were very upset about it. Uh, meanwhile, the private life of the bar now, I suppose, was a particular hobby of um, ours, because we're nuts about owls, I suppose that's the, the way to put it. And um, we set out to make a film for the BBC that would just tell people just a lot more about the barn owl than you know, was originally known. And so we reared a family of barn owls, we bred them in captivity, we filmed barn owls in the wild, we um, devised really an entirely new method of photography to film barn owls in complete darkness to see how they um, caught their prey differently in total darkness than in daylight. So uh, in, in some ways, that was a complete breakthrough. The Unofficial Countryside was a film based on a book by Richard Maybe, uh, who wrote a marvelous book called Food for Free. And it's about the wildlife or the natural history that abounds in the center of London. Um, kestrels nesting in furniture factories, uh, badgers in the backs of people's gardens. Um, what else? Uh, very rare ducks in some of the reservoirs in, in, the, in the center of London. Mm -hmm. All sorts of strange things that you find and look, uh, look for, but don't necessarily see. Mm -hmm. um, other films we've done like that. Um, the one about Amundsen, which again was about a famous explorer he used dogs in an entirely different way. They, to him, were mere tools, if you like, to enable him to get to the uh, South Pole. Uh, he was completely dispassionate about them. So again, it was um, a human-animal relationship. With David and Janet Cobham, Free Talk in the Autumn. 91, take one. Ten seconds of closer. Tell us, David, briefly the genesis of uh, your film, Tark of the Otter. Well, Sorry. well, Sorry. <laughs> 91, take two. The genesis of your film, David. Um, Janet and I made a film with Henry Williamson called The Vanishing Hedgerows, 
And it was while we were making this film, which was for BBC, that um, Henry obviously trusted us. Speed, market. 91, take three. Yes, sir. What are the problems inherent in directing a little creature like that? It looks a very peaceable little animal, but I believe they're not quite as easy as that, are they, Jenna? Um, peace, it, I think it looks peaceable now because obviously with the lights it's um, possibly feeling a little sleepy. The logistics involved in making any film can be horrendous. Mm. Uh, but I believe that the one or two that you came up against with Tarka um, during the making of this film that can be counted outside the play language. David, um, the greatest part of your career has been spent on films about birds, animals, um, and wildlife in general, rather than people, and I wonder why. I, d I don't think that's absolutely true. Would you incorporate? Sure, sure. Let's look at some of the other films that you've made and get your reactions to them. Would you preface the answer with the title of the film? Uh, the Mad Trapper. The Mad Trapper uh, was a true story about a man who came up from uh, supposedly um, the United States of America, up into Canada. Nobody knew anything about him at all. He wanted to settle quite peacefully in the Yukon, same area as where the gold rush was. And uh, it was uh, in an interesting uh, time during the Depression when a lot of people just wanted to get away from very bad times. He um, settled himself in a cabin and then fell foul of an Indian who'd got some trap lines nearby. And uh, the Indian reported him to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. The Mounted Police came round to interview him, and then everything broke, all hell broke loose. Um, the, the, uh, the Mounted Police were not very tactful. Uh, eventually, one of them was shot and wounded. And then there was the biggest manhunt there's ever been in Canada at that particular time. It was the first time they ever used airplanes, first time they used shortwave radio to track a man down. And I believe I'm right in saying that he led them on a chase for about 50 or 60 days. Um, another man was killed, another uh, Royal Canadian Mounted Policeman was killed. And eventually, after this 50 or 60 day chase, they, they cornered him and shot him. A very, very exciting story indeed, and, and true. And they still, to this day, don't know who the Mad Trapper was. The Private Life of a Barn Owl. The unofficial countryside. The shadow... Speed. The Shadow of the Falcon. Dan Badger and All the Coal. Briefly, the influences on your work. Who's had the greatest influence on David Cullen? Citizen Kane was the first film I saw, I think, which uh, made me say that there is something special about filmmaking. I think um, Francois Truffaut said that, uh, who's a film director and then a critic, said that uh, Citizen Kane had probably influenced more people into um, going into the film industry than any other film. Um, it's accused of um, being overpraised, but I think all the innovations, which singularly have been used before, were all brought together into that particular film, and it's dramatically uh, extraordinary, I think. And uh, I, I, th I feel that films before Citizen Kane were like sentences that were unpunctuated, and that uh, Wells brought punctuation into filmmaking, really. Strange choice for a man who concentrated his career on animals and, and wildlife. I, uh, other films, I suppose, which have influenced me have been um, the Disney films, which came out uh, in about the uh, early 50s, uh, The True Life Adventures, one particular one, Beaver Valley, which I think was the first one, a very happy film. And then another film, which I think is probably one of the most dramatic animal uh, films. Again, it's got human beings in it, but the animals were terribly well handled by a Swedish director called Arne Zuxdorf, The Great Adventure. Um, that certainly influenced me and made me want to make that kind of film.
uh, again, a very happy film with the, with the two boys and the otter and the, the fox. Marvellous images of the fox jumping in the snow, catching mice. Janet, in, is Tarka the otter intended as anything more than an entertainment? Films like this, what, what films involve strange incidents, um, I know there was one particular day that must have been horrendous for you all when you made this film. Could you tell us about it? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.